Good afternoon, everyone. I had no idea how timely this talk was going to be. Um, how many of you had a stressful morning? <laughs> so um, I need to make sure I have two pads. Um, so let me just uh, start by welcoming you. So my name is Michael Penn. I'm Vice President for Diversity Outreach and Mentoring here at Gladstone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is uh, an experiment. So the title of this speaker series is called Empower and Disrupt. And the whole idea is to empower us as scientists, as administrators, as people. Um, and how many of you were at the first Empower and Disrupt uh, with John Gates? Two of the greats, we've got some people here. So John Gates is a diversity expert, and one of the things that he, uh, the message that he brought was diversity is about excellence, and it's about creating an environment where people can give their best contributions. So this series uh, is really in that spirit. So the whole idea is to leverage knowledge that you might not otherwise get in a scientific environment uh, that can actually help empower you to do better science and be more effective as a person and as a professional. So that is the intent behind Empower and Disrupt. Um, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Aliyah Crum, and she's an assistant professor at Stanford. Um, she's had quite the Ivy League uh, training. She went to uh, Harvard for undergrad, and she did her PhD uh, at Yale. Um, and then she did an internship uh, with uh, the, a VA hospital, so she actually has uh, a great deal of experience uh, with veterans and, and trauma, and that has informed, I think, her research. She then did a postdoctoral fellowship at Columbia uh, with Professor Akinola, and she's won many, many awards. Uh, and as you can imagine, the topic of how our brains, how our thinking, and how our mindset can actually impact objective and physiological criteria like stress is of high interest to a lot of people. So her work has actually been covered uh, very extensively in the Wall Street Journal and the Stanford uh, Harvard Business Review, et cetera. So I am really, really happy to welcome uh, Dr. Aliyah Crum. Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. So it's such an honor to be here. I obviously, I love sharing my work, but it's very rare that I get to give a talk with sort of two hats on. You know, as Michael mentioned, I have a history of, and most of what I do now is research on how our aspects of our minds, our thoughts, beliefs, and expectations can change our physical health as well as our well-being. Um, but I'm also trained as a clinical psychologist, and I've done some work as an organizational consultant and trainer. So it's fun to be able to be here and speak to you with both hats. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a body of research on stress and how we can change aspects of our mind to change the physiological and behavioral response to stress. But I don't want to just talk about the research because at the end of the day, uh, most of us, I'm sure, experience stress on a regular basis. So what really matters is can we use that research, those theories, those ideas, to actually fundamentally rethink or change how we experience stress in our lives. Uh, so that's the goal for today, to talk about some of the research, but then also to give you some strategies on how to improve your own responses to stress. So uh, as we begin, I just want to have you take a few minutes to reflect. And I want you to reflect on one thing in particular, and that is think back to a time in your life in which you experienced substantial growth. So this can be on a professional level, some time that you really uh, grew as a, uh, as a professor, or as a doctor, as a scientist, or as whatever it is you do. Um, or personal growth, sometimes maybe it's in the home with a relationship, et cetera. So take a moment to think about that. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a second question, and that is this. Did that time that you experienced this great amount of growth involve any stress or struggle? Raise your hand if it did. Aha, <laughs> it's interesting, right? What we find is that we spend so much time trying to remove stress in our lives, and yet when we think about how we've really learned and grew as individuals in our personal lives, in our professional lives, 
almost all, if not all of those times, involve some stress to actually produce that growth. Um, so I would even, you know, ask you a third question. Would that same level of growth have been possible without some form of stress or struggle? Some psychologists would argue that true transformative change cannot occur without some form of stress or struggle. So this is one perspective on stress, which is that stress is actually useful to help us learn and grow and change in our lives. Um, but what's interesting about that perspective is it's not very common, right? So when you think about what the typical mindset is about stress, it's what? Stress is bad. So here's what we often see on the nature of stress. So uh, everywhere we look, basically, there are signs and symbols and uh, warnings reminding us about the negative effects of stress. So over the years, stress has been called a growing plague. It's been called an epidemic. The American Institute of Stress, a whole institute devoted to combating the negative effects of stress, has linked stress to the six leading causes of disease. And the World Health Organization has gone as far to say that stress is America's number one health problem. So as was mentioned, I was trained as a clinical psychologist, so I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you what I was trained to ask as a clinical psychologist, and that is, in thinking about these negative effects of stress, how does that make you feel? Stress. <laughs> More stress, right? Isn't it interesting that in all of our good at uh, attempts, these are well-intentioned attempts to warn people about the negative effects of stress, what might we be doing is actually creating more stress. Are we, in fact, kind of creating the problem that we're attempting to solve? So what I'd like to point out today is that there are two fundamentally flawed assumptions in our understanding about stress and our understanding about what to do with it. The first is that the, uh, the effects of stress are only negative. Uh, this is not totally true, um, but it's flawed to see stress as being only negative and not recognize its enhancing qualities. The second fundamental flaw in our understanding around stress is that the goal is to counteract, so to avoid or manage the stress that we experience. These are fundamental uh, uh, flaws in our understanding of stress. So let's tackle the first one. Uh, so is stress negative? Well, yes, there's lots of research to support that stress can have debilitating or damaging effects on our performance, absenteeism, et cetera, on our health. We have immune deficiencies, heart disease, et cetera. And of course, we all know stress can affect our personal well-being and can even go as far to cause depression or other mental illness. But if we took a moment, and I've done this, uh, to literally lay out all the research that's been done on stress. We could put it in this room. It would probably fill the floor in this room. What you would find is that it's like most bodies of literature, and that is that it's not so clear cut. So there's a lot of research, very good, a strong body of research showing the exact opposite. Okay, so in the domain of performance, what research has shown is that stress actually doesn't, wasn't, our stress response wasn't designed to kind of hijack our rational mind. In fact, it was designed to boost our performance. So there's been some really good research showing that the experience of uh, the stress response, glucocorticoids, et cetera, speeds the rate at which we process information. So right, you know, as, as humans, on average, we process things about 20 frames per second. If we all went to New Zealand, and jumped off uh, uh, a ravine with a bungee cord attached. That'd be a fun thing to do for a Gladstone outing. Uh, <laughs> we, what we would find is if the, if the uh, numbers were at the bottom of the ravine, we could read those at a faster rate. Why? Because the uh, body's stress response speeds up the rate at which we're processing information. Larry Cahill out of UC Irvine's done some really important work showing that the experience of stress can actually improve memory. So how he studies this is he has students taking memory tasks normally at a computer, and then he has them stick their hand in a bucket of ice water and finds that when they have their hand in a bucket of ice water, they actually remember things better. 
<laughs> so you can see all my students with their hand in a bucket of ice water. Um, what about health? You might think, OK, that's fine, but that's just sort of acute stress. It might boost our mind in a moment. But you know, enduring stress over time is going to have damaging effects on health. And in fact, there's a small body of research, but a strong body of research showing that the experience of stress creates what's called physiological toughening. So Alyssa Eppel, who's at UCSF, uh, Bruce McEwen, and others have looked at how the experience of catabolic hormones release the experience of anabolic hormones, and that we need the anabolic hormones to build our body stronger. And then you might think, OK, fine, well, that must be just short-term acute stress. And in fact, what researchers have shown is that even the most traumatic stressors, so military abuse, uh, military trauma, domestic abuse, even the most chronic enduring stressors like poverty, discrimination, not all the time, but can in some cases create what uh, some call post-traumatic growth, which is the experience of mental toughness, deepened relationships, a greater appreciation for life, not in spite of that stress, but actually because of it. So I could talk all day about the research on stress. The point is not to try to argue that it's enhancing and not debilitating, but to point out that the true nature of stress is a paradox. And so then the question becomes not just how do we get rid of the debilitating effects, but what's the distinguishing effect factor? What lever can we pull to actually make these enhancing effects more likely? So this is not a new question. Psychologists have studied this for a very long time. And the traditional assumption was that the moderating variable, the distinguishing factor, is in the amount of stress. Right? So we have this assumption that if you're increasing your stress on the axis, x-axis here, that can actually improve your health or performance or well-being up until a point upon which you hit this tipping point of self-destruction, everything crumbles and stress becomes negative. What's the problem with this? Practically. OK, so there's a problem. Uh, theoretically, it's very difficult to measure the amount of stress. Sub stress is inherently subjective. You know, one person's problem might be, to another person, not a big, big deal at all. Yeah. Yeah, this, well, first of all, when you look at the research, this just doesn't pan out because everybody's tipping point is different. For some, the most extreme stressors are actually not a tipping point at all. Uh, so there's issues in measurement there. Any other practical issues with this? If you're using this not as a scientist, but as somebody who wants to learn how to manage your stress, and you're over here at a three and a half, what's the implication? Reduce your stress, right? I mean, that's the obvious implication. The problem with that is we don't often have the ability and or the luxury to reduce the amount of stress that we're facing. Would you like to be able to push that timeline off for your proposal that's due? Sure. I talk to my students. They say, you know, I'm really stressed. I have five exams and two papers. I say, great, just do three exams, <laughs> right? It's April, you know, April, well, it's April 14th, taxes are due, it's the 15th, they're due, I hopefully you've all had them done. You know, you're stressed about that perhaps, I could just say, mm, just don't do them. <laughs> you know, it's problematic, we think all these stress management, stress reduction techniques, it's like, in reality, it's extremely difficult to reduce the amount of stress we face, so this is just not very viable. So the second assumption was, OK, well, if that's not possible, let's just figure out how to manage stress. So let's just figure out like, the, the amount of coping. We can just cope with it, right? So we can just uh, eat well, and we can exercise, and we can see a therapist, and we can meditate, and we can do all these things so we can cope or counteract the stress response. We can endure this level of stress or higher levels of stress. What's the problem with that? Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Any, raise your hand if you've been, uh, ever been stressed because you needed to get exercise <laughs> or meditate or talk it, talk it out with your husband. Yeah. So 
this also is problematic. We're like, here's all the techniques that you can do. In many cases, those just add to the to-do list, thereby creating more stress. So what I want to suggest to you today, and this is what we've been working on over the last 10 years of research, is that there's a third possibility. This happens all the time. This approach, this possibility happens in what you just thought about in your own lives, in which, yeah, you're having a little bit of a struggle, but then there's a bifurcation of this curve. Then you actually reach a new curve upon which you're more resilient and you can withstand higher levels of stress and reach higher levels of performance because of that stress. Right? So that's kind of in the abstract, but you can think of this in simple ways, like this is just going from the first to second grade. <laughs> right? like, this happens every day in our lives. We are amazing human creatures that are, we're, we have this incredible ability to learn and grow and improve. Stress is the catalyst of that. But we don't think of it that way. So why don't we think of it that way? Well, one reason is there are a lot of reasons in terms of what's shown in the media, um, but essentially we've created a mindset about stress, that stress is debilitating. So what is a mindset? Well, a mindset is a lens or frame uh, which orients us to a particular set of associations and expectations. So at any given moment, or even just in the case of stress, the amount of information to take in is unwieldy. So we need simplifying systems, lenses, or cognitive schemas to make sense and organize that information. Right? The lenses we choose uh, are what we call uh, mindsets. Now, these mindsets are, we need these as humans. We can't exist without kind of simplifying things somehow, some way, but they're not inconsequential. And this is what we've shown over several years of research, is that the mindsets that we choose, or we have, with or without our choosing, have dramatic consequences for our health, for our performance, for our well-being. So here's a few examples. This is work done by Carol Dweck. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with Carol Dweck's research. Okay, so she's a professor at Stanford in psychology uh, as well. And her whole lifetime of work has been on looking at mindsets about intelligence. And what she's found is that many children have a mindset that intelligence is fixed. This started with sort of IQ testing, uh, where they used to actually sit students in a classroom in ordered number according to their IQ. So if you're number one, <laughs> if you have the highest IQ, you'd be in seat number one, second highest. And she, Carol, was actually in seat number one, uh, which sounds great, right? She was like, that was great when I was in elementary school. But then, you know, when I got to, to college, she had always assumed that she had this high level of intelligence. But then she started doubting herself, right? What if she's not the highest in high school? What if she's not the highest in college? And she noticed herself being demotivated by her high levels of intelligence. And what she realized was she had a particular mindset about intelligence, which is that it's fixed. It's something that's stable. And yet there was another possibility, and that was you could view intelligence as, or ability as something that's malleable, something you could learn, something you could grow, something you could improve on. And that shift in mindset would change the whole game. So she studied children over many decades, and what she's found is when she can get them to shift their mindset, this lens through which they're viewing intelligence, from something that's fixed to something that's malleable, some dramatic effects occur. So uh, kids start having a greater appreciation for academics. They start liking it better. They have more motivation to do well. Why do well? Why work harder if you can't grow? Right? There's no point. Uh, and they've seen per improved performance after failures and setba setbacks and many, many objective measures, such as GPA, uh, college entrance exams, how they, where they end up in, uh, in life, et, et cetera. So that's one mindset. I've kind of taken that idea and extended it into domains of health. Uh, so this was one study I did with Ellen Langer, who's a professor at Harvard. Uh, and what we did was we worked with uh, hotel room attendants. So we found that these women, usually women, uh, tend to be in pretty poor states of health. So many of them have hypertension, many of them are obese. Um, and they go to their doctor and they come home, and you know, or their doctor will say, you know, um, you're really in a poor state of health. You should consider joining a gym. You need to get more exercise. 
So now they're feeling badly about the fact that they're in this poor state of health. And what we realized was, that's funny, right? Because when you think about the nature of their work, what they are doing all day long is, in fact, physical activity. So it's tough to quantify the exact amount, but you know, just vacuuming burns about 30 calories um, per, or sorry, uh, 100 calories per 30 minutes. Um, you know, it's clear that they're getting above and beyond the Surgeon General's requirements, which are to accumulate 30 minutes of moderate physical activity per day. They're probably getting more exercise than you or me. I'm guessing on a daily basis in terms of activity. So all we did was we took these room attendants, we split them into two conditions, we worked with seven different hotels, and half of the room attendants we told that, hey, you know, your work is good exercise. So instead of going home at the end of the day and feeling exhausted uh, from your work, go home and see that exhaustion as a result of doing good hard exercise and expect to receive the benefits. And what we found in this study was changing their mindset from their seeing their work as just work to viewing it as good exercise uh, actually improved their job satisfaction, maybe not surprisingly, um, but more intriguingly, it has a, had a physiological effect. So just after four weeks of shifting their mindset, they had lower systolic blood pressure and they had a significant drop in weight loss. So this was about a 10-point systolic blood pressure drop, which is uh, clinically meaningful. It was a two-pound weight loss, which is not a ton of weight, but pretty interesting considering this was a result of just a simple change in mindset, not a change in doing anything different in their actual behavior. In another study, we looked at mindsets about what we eat, uh, this is a fun study to do uh, in New Haven. We had community members come in to drink milkshakes. Uh, we gave them a milkshake that we told them was either this sensible 140-calorie shake or this really indulgent 620-calorie shake. This is 56 grams of sugar, uh, 30 grams of fat. So very different sort of images or uh, expectations about what they were consuming. The catch was that in both of these cases, it was the same exact milkshake. So here they are drinking the same exact milkshake, which was about right in the middle, it was about 300 calories, but consuming it in two totally different mindsets. What we found, and we had them hooked up to um, an IV because we were measuring ghrelin, which is a gut peptide uh, that relates to hunger and metabolism. So theoretically, ghrelin levels after you eat drop in proportion to the amount of calories you consume. So if we go out after this and have a big steak dinner, ghrelin levels will plummet, signaling to the brain you can stop eating and also speeding up metabolism to process the, the nutrients that were just ingested. What we found was even though, you know, theoretically, this shouldn't, ghrelin levels shouldn't differ depending on their mindset, but what we found that is that wasn't true. Uh, so when they consumed the same exact shake, if they thought it was indulgent, thought it was high calorie, they had a greater, greater mitigating effect on ghrelin uh, than when they thought it was sensible. Okay, so you start to see, it's like, okay, this is not to suggest that exercise has no objective or physiological benefit or that you know, there's no meaning to the nutrients. There is. And we should account for that. But one thing that we've been failing to account for, I think, in a lot of this uh, research, especially on behavioral health, is that what we think about our exercise, is it good enough? Is it, you know, is it uh, going to prevent heart disease? What we think about what we're eating, is it filling enough? Is it rich enough? Is it tasty enough? That also has an impact on our health. So this, of course, brings me to the topic of today, which is on stress. Right? So how do our mindsets about the nature of stress influence the effects of stress? You can see here there are two different mindsets we might take. So one is that stress is going to have debilitating effects. The other might be that stress could have enhancing effects. So we've designed a scale to test this. Um, and essentially, we ask a bunch of questions. It's eight questions, take the average of which. And you can see that somebody's mindset about stress uh, rests on this continuum. So you can think for a minute what your mindset might be or might have been before coming in here. And we've tested this in a variety of samples. Here's one. We worked with the Federal Reserve. Uh, this is a group of Federal Reserve employees, and we found that they have, you know, on average, they're on, more on this debilitating side of the scale. 
Here's uh, UBS employees. This was with a group that we studied in 2009. So this was right after the financial collapse. And they, too, have a stress and debilitating mindset. About 85% of our samples and sort of lay populations have a stress is debilitating mindset as opposed to a stress is enhancing mindset. So where do you think Columbia undergraduates are? Do you think they uh, have more of a stress is debilitating mindset? Raise your hand. OK, what do you, th do you think they have a stress is enhancing mindset? More of a stress is enhancing. OK. Uh, so they have an even more stress is debilitating <laughs> mindset, which has me quite concerned about the state of our future, considering they have this more stress is debilitating mindset than the Federal Reserve. Um, <laughs> So all of these samples were about, you know, a majority were in this debilitating side. Can you think of any group that might be in the enhancing side? <laughs> we got some ER workers, athletes. So we just did a study with Navy SEALs, and they are the only group that I've surveyed so far that actually have a, uh, that are more on this enhancing side of the scale which is interesting. We're going to see what the effect of that is. So we've done, you know, when we look at just correlationally, this measure, controlling for other measures, like how much stress someone is experiencing and what they're doing to cope with it, predicts pretty important things like negative health symptoms, work performance, and life satisfaction. But that's not really all that useful um, if we don't know that we can change it. So we've done a series of studies to see if we, can, if we can change people's mindsets about stress. How might we do that? How easily can we change people's mindsets? And what might the effect be of doing so? So in this study, uh, we gave people, and we've done this in a variety of studies, we created these video clips that talk about the research on stress, anecdotes, that all true, but oriented towards one mindset or the other. So I'm going to show you just uh, these simultaneously. Um, but keep in mind, so in this one study that I'm going to present, uh, we gave these to the UBS employees three times during the week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, before the bell rang to start their day. Okay? So half were in the debilitating condition, half were in the enhancing condition. But I'm going to show them to you simultaneously. You get the point, yes? <laughs> Should replace Steph Curry with that. Um, so it's fascinating, right? It's like just so profound to see them both simultaneously, you know? And it's, it's not like we're, you know, in, in the milkshake study, for example, we did deceive them. We were giving them false information about what they were consuming. This isn't deception. This is just biasing what they're looking at, you know, sort of uh, painting the picture uh, around one viewpoint or the other. So we, we had them watch these videos. This was the one that shows how stress affects performance. We had a video on how stress affects health and how stress affects well-being and personal growth uh, throughout the course of the week. And then we measured them on uh, their negative health symptoms. So these are symptoms that relate to anxiety and stress, like backaches, muscle tension, insomnia, headaches, et cetera. And we also measured them on subjective work performance. 
And here's what we found. With the negative health symptoms, you can see that there was a, oops, uh, a reduction in the number of health symptoms that they experienced over the course of this week if they were in the stress is enhancing mindset, so this blue line. Whereas the stress is debilitating mindset didn't get worse. They actually stayed about the same. Uh, you could maybe have uh, hypothesized that they might get worse because they're being reinforced. Uh, we were kind of happy with this result because that's what we told the IRB was going to happen. <laughs> we said, you know, the, the ethics board, we said, don't worry, we're not going to make them worse because this is the mindset that is common in our society. And that was, in fact, true. And the reverse was true for the work performance. So just watching, this was a total of nine minutes of watching video clips improved their work performance. So this is things like uh, quantity, quality, efficiency, and accuracy of work, as well as engagement, focus, generating new ideas, et cetera. So these are self-reported uh, work performance. We've done a variety of studies since this to look at the um, objective effects of mindset. So in other studies, we've seen changes in uh, cognitive attention, so where people are focused during stress. And we find that when you're in a stress-enhancing mindset, you're more oriented towards happy faces uh, less, um, less oriented towards threatening faces. We've seen changes in cortisol. So when you have a stress-enhancing mindset, you have a moderate cortisol response, not a hyper or hypo. We have changes in uh, DHEAS, which is a growth-promoting hormone when you're in the stress-enhancing mindset. I'm happy to share more of the research with you um, if you're interested. Okay, but let's turn now from the kind of theoretical overview of why might we want to fundamentally rethink our approach to stress and why mindsets might be a critical tool in uh, producing beneficial effects. Uh, so let's move to this more um, practical or sort of personal approach, which is what can we actually do to shift our mindset? So in these videos, it was great for a research scientist because I can manipulate people into different mindsets. But it's not all that useful um, to go around and just show people biased information, right? I mean, we do all the time. But you know, the more, uh, uh, the more useful approach would be to see if we can give people the complete nature of stress, be straight up with them about it, and then suggest that they might want to, to choose consciously and deliberately to adopt a stress-enhancing mindset. So we've developed this three-step approach to choose or uh, adopt a stress-enhancing mindset. So the first is to acknowledge stress. So rather than denying stress, which we so often do, can we actually acknowledge it? Second is to welcome stress, which sounds crazy because we spend most of our life avoiding stress. Can we actually turn and welcome it because it's something we care about? I'll go into that. And then lastly, can and we stop spending our time, money, our effort, and our energy trying to get rid or counteract the stress response, and use that same time, that same money and energy, trying to utilize the stress response. OK, so let's go through these. This is the first one. So acknowledge stress. Why would it matter to kind of shift from denying stress to simply acknowledging it? Why is this step of simply acknowledging stress so powerful? Well, let me ask you. Uh, I'll, I'll put a challenge out for you. So in the next 30 seconds, I'll time you. Whatever you do, you can think about anything you want to. Anything. Anything is fair game, except for don't think about a white bear. Okay, ready, go. Raise your hand if you've thought of a white bear. <laughs> we, got, <laughs> we got one. Are you sure? What do you think of now? <laughs> Um, OK, so why is it so important to acknowledge stress is what's called ironic mental processing. So this, it's um, this phenomenon in which when we try really hard to avoid something, actually what our brain does is it constantly checks in to make sure we're avoiding that something. And as soon as it checks in, what does it do? It's like, there it is again, right? There's that white bear. I'm not going to think about a white bear. I'm not going to think about a white bear. Am I thinking about a white bear? Oh, there's the white bear. Um, so we, we see this, and we, there's also countless decades of research on the detriments of suppressing negative emotion. Um, but so why this matters is that when we just do this simple shift 
to focusing on acknowledging stress, it actually reduces some of the cognitive uh, load that it takes to avoid it. And that frees up our attention to uh, do more useful things with our mind. So I want you to take a minute and, and actually think about, as we go through these three steps, think about a stressor in your life right now. Okay? So, and just take a moment to acknowledge it. And what acknowledgement means doesn't mean, oh, let me, you know, go on my rant about how awful this is. Just simply answer the question, I am stressed about X. Okay? Actually, go ahead. If you don't, well, hmm. yeah, why don't you turn to a partner? I'm going to do this. Why don't you turn to a partner and just share one thing that you're stressed about, okay? You can, you can change the names to protect the innocent if you want. <laughs> All right. Don't go on your rants, remember. All right, so just that fun, you know, that simple act of acknowledging it. Now I want you to think about what are your typical reactions to that stress? All right, so you might say, okay, I'm stressed about... Um, this manuscript that I need to revise and get in by Monday. Uh, this is true. <laughs> this is stressing me out now. Uh, what are my reactions? Well, first, I might get highly anxious. I might get, uh, you know, I often get kind of, all of a sudden, I'll get really tired, right? I just feel exhausted. Uh, my other response is I have this tendency to, you know, watch reruns of The West Wing. Uh, <laughs> physiologically, I, you know, the fatigue, so it's fatigue. I'm, like, drawn to watch the what, what, rest, West, West Wing. Um, I might be snapping at my husband, you know. So think for a minute about what your typical responses are to this stress. Okay, so you can start to just identify, because oftentimes we don't know what our own physiological or psychological responses are. Um, but why is this so important? Well, why this is so important, just quickly, um, is some really important research on the importance of acknowledging or labeling emotion. So this is Matt Lieberman's work. He's a professor at UCLA. Uh, and this was just one study that he's done where he had people in an fMRI scanner looking at uh, stressful images, negative, provocative images. And what he did was he had them view those images, and then he had them do something very simple, which was every time they saw a negative image, they just had to label the emotion they were feeling. Okay, so click image, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling anger, I'm feeling fearful. And what he found was that the activity in their brain shifted from the amygdala region, which is the stress, fight or flight region, to the uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, which is a shift from sort of this reactive region to stress to a place in which we're able to do more conscious and deliberative thought. So it seems natural. Why don't we just put those stressors out of our mind? Let's not worry about the workload. Let's not worry about this program that I'm putting together. But in fact, trying to do that actually keeps our mind hijacked on the stress. And when we just acknowledge it, it moves where we process that to the, the areas in the brain where we can think more clearly, act more deliberately. So this is the first step and the three steps. The second one is once you've acknowledged what it is you're stressed about, and maybe acknowledge what are my kind of natural tendencies to this, the next step is to, instead of trying to avoid the stress, can you actually welcome the stress? Well, that sounds crazy. You might think, why would I ever want to welcome my stress, right? I don't want to welcome uh, increased workload or a fight with the spouse or a rejected paper or whatever it might be for you. Why we recognize stress is that part and parcel with the definition of stress is something we care about, okay? So the definition of stress is the experience or anticipation of threat or adversity in one's goal-related efforts. So a couple things are important there. One, it can be the experience of or just the thought of something going wrong, right? That causes stress. Uh, threat or adversity, even challenge, any kind of thing that's going against you in one's goal-related efforts. What are goal-related efforts? Something we care about, something we have a goal for. If I told you that Johnny was failing school, that wouldn't necessarily stress you out, right? Unless Johnny was your son, 
or you were Johnny, <laughs> or Johnny was somebody you cared about, or you cared about kids passing school, right? So the essence of the problem or the challenge or the threat does not become stressful until or unless it's something that relates to what you care about, to your goals. So this is fundamental, and we forgot that in the midst of trying to just warn people about the negative effects of stress. And what we're doing is by avoiding the stress, in many cases, we're actually throwing out the bath, the baby with the bathwater. You see a lot of people who struggle with purpose and meaning in their life. A lot of that is because they're trying to avoid having to deal with any adversity, any challenges. So let's move to this point of the reflection exercise, and that is to start to just reconnect with the positive motivation behind that stress. So that thing that you came up with in the first step, I want you to answer this question. So I'm stressed about X, what you just talked about, because I care about what? What is it that you care about? Now, importantly, you need to get to a place where that truly is a goal-related effort or something you positively care about, right? For me, it's like I'm stressed about this uh, revise, you know, paper I need to revise because I care about you know, getting that stupid reviewer off my back. Well, is that what I really care about? You know, maybe right now. Well, I care about that why because I care about you know, uh, communicating my science in a way that's compelling. I care about having papers that are published that are actually meaningful, that people respect, that they understand. I care about doing science that engages people that has a positive impact in people's lives. I care about having a positive impact in people's lives. You see how sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get to that care, okay? So go ahead and just take a moment just in your own mind uh, and reflect and answer this question. So I hope that, you know, you know, and think for yourself how, you know, even just answering this question, how did that shift kind of the, the feeling about that stress, right? The stress doesn't go away magically. It's, this isn't a magic potion, you know, <laughs> um, treatment I'm giving you, but it, it really fundamentally changes the nature of it, right? So you go from being annoyed or frustrated to a point where, like, you might even leave the field of academia. I have, you know, a lot of grad students who are like, this is so difficult, right? And that's a moment where it's like, okay, well, is that care underlying why you're doing it really, like, is that there? You know, and if that's there, that's going to fuel it, right? But oftentimes, they slowly lose the connection to the purpose because they're trying to get rid of the stress. They're not going to get rid of the stress, right? We can make it easier. We can try to have more, you know, do everything we can to make things easier. I'm not saying, you know, don't do that, but also recognize that stress is going to be there. Recognize what you care uh, beneath it. So this actually, this idea... Um, came to me in a real personal way, actually. So um, when I was a grad student, so th I did this uh, work for my dissertation. Uh, but before I knew what I was going to do my dissertation on, I was pretty stressed. <laughs> I was uh, really anxious about kind of like, OK, am I going to be, am I going to make any kind of difference in the world? What do I want to do out of all the things I could possibly do? Uh, I had a meeting with my advisor. Uh, Peter Salovey, who you might know, he, was the, uh, he coined the term emotional intelligence. Most people think it was Daniel Goleman, but Daniel Goleman just wrote the best-selling book on, on the topic. Um, and Peter is now the, the president of Yale, but at the time, I mean, so he was the provost, and so I'm like, I got to go meet with this guy, I got to tell him something smart, you know. <laughs> um, it was a highly stressful uh, situation, and I had all this data, and I was, I was just really anxious. I was anxious about my value. I was anxious about what I was going to do. And I was, it was late at night, and I was in the basement of the psychology department, which is where they put all the grad students, um, where, they, <laughs> where they had the, the computer lab. And it was, it was late at night, and I was there and just trying to, you know, do some work and pull some ideas together. And I heard the door open. And the door opened, and this guy peeked his head in. And the guy was uh, Brett Logan, who was the IT guy at Yale in the psych department. And, you know, we had been friends, and he had an office there. I'm not sure what he was doing there so late at night, but he happened to be there. And he opened up the door, and he looked in, and I was like, hi, Brett, I can't talk right now. I've got too much to do. And he goes, just a cold, dark night on the side of Everest. And then <laughs> shut the door. And I'm, I, this is a true story. I'm not kidding. This happened, and I was like, 
okay, <laughs> you know, see you later, I got a lot to do. It didn't occur to me until about two weeks later what he meant. I remember distinctly, I woke up in the middle of the night and it occurred to me what he was talking about, right? If, if you were climbing Everest, right, you could imagine that there might be some nights that you'd be cold, <laughs> that it'd be dark, right? Maybe you'd be tired, but what did you expect? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, did you expect that climbing Everest would be a walk in the park? <laughs> no, right? So what did I expect? What do you expect? You know, I, I'm trying to get a PhD, you know, did I expect it to be a walk in the park? Would climbing Everest, would, you know, doing great research, would getting a PhD, would having children be such wonderful things if they were simply just walks in the park? No, a lot of the great things that we do in life are great in part because we have cold, dark nights, right? So this really changed the whole game for me. I'm forever grateful uh, to Brett for kind of shifting my mindset about those nights. Um, and it actually was the sort of the fuel that um, led me to do this work for my dissertation. So we've talked about the first step, which is to acknowledge stress. We've moved to the second step, which is to welcome stress. Let's go now to the third step, which is once you've acknowledged stress and then you've reconnected with why you're stressed, what's the personal motivation behind that, then the real challenge becomes, as I talked about before, how do I shift the natural physiological and cognitive stress response? How can I utilize that response to actually meet the underlying care? right? The getting a PhD, the being a great mother, to being a great president, to doing whatever it is that you want to do. How can I channel that more effectively? Okay, so this is, again, your time to reflect. So first is to think back to those typical re responses you have, whether it's to kind of lose your focus or, you know, and of course, you all are probably very successful at this in many ways. So think about some things you might do that aren't so useful, right? Uh, when I'm feeling really tired, you know, and I start snapping at my husband uh, when I'm stressed about something, think about that typical reaction and see if you can channel it. So instead of trying to avoid the stress or get rid of the stress, to actually help achieve the underlying care. Specifically, what changes can you make in responding to this stress uh, so that the stress you experience can be enhancing as opposed to debilitating? That. So, We've gone through some of the foundations in terms of the research that's led up to this idea that our mindsets matter in stress. Uh, again, I'm happy to share any of that empirical work with you. We've talked about these three steps that I think can fundamentally change your own approach to stress. I just want to end with a few clarifications. Uh, so I don't know if you can read this, but it says, and so without further ado, here's the author of Mind Over Matter, and they're running into a, <laughs> a poll. Oftentimes I get that because I study mindset placebo effects, and I, you know, it's important to say that, look, I'm not saying that uh, our mindsets are limitless, right? Just that we don't yet know where those limits are, and oftentimes we don't account for the powerful role that simple shifts in mindset can make. In this case, it's not about denying the potentially deteriorating aspects of stress. Can, stress can and does have debilitating uh, effects. It's not about thinking that the stressor is necessarily a good thing. I said this, it's not about thinking that a diagnosis or a trauma or you know, even excessive workload is a good thing, right? And it's not about seeking out unnecessary stress. So I'm not <laughs> suggesting get that bucket of ice water and put your hand and do it while you work, although that might help. Um, what it is about, it's about honoring the paradox of stress. It's about recognizing the truth of stress, which is paradoxical. It's about recognizing the power of mindset, that simple lens or frame through which we're viewing the inevitable stressors in our lives. And it's about learning to stress better. Right? Why? Because we're going to experience stress in our lives. It's inherent to what it means to be human. When we have this mindset that stress is debilitating, it has a cascade of effects. 
motivation under that mindset is to avoid or counteract the stress response. This leads to hyper or hypoarousal, all of these negative effects. When you shift the mindset, just a simple shift, the whole game changes. Okay, the motivation is not to run away or hide. Now the motivation is to utilize the stress to achieve desired ends. This leads to optimal arousal. It leads to greater desire for feedback. You want to learn. You want to grow. You want to understand, why, do I, why don't I have that data? What am I not doing? Why am I not getting this paper? What am I not you know, seeing? And we've seen this in our research. It leads to an optimal arousal marked by moderate cortisol response, boosted DHEAS, Attention is biased towards the positive aspects. Affect, we don't see a reduction in negative affect. So people still feel annoyed that they're stressed, right? But what they do feel is a boosted sense of engagement, of positive affect, of confidence, of joy, of purpose. And all of these things can lead to enhanced health. So you can see here, the simple shift in mindset changes the whole game. And what's even more powerful is that when you start to do this in your life and have effects, the effects actually serve to reinforce the mindset. So it's this uh, spiral of success that's actually fueled by the stress. Right? So with that, I will end. Um, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to share this work with you. And I would love to stick around and answer questions, talk to you, share research, um, hear your uh, comments or concerns, et cetera. So thank you. You mentioned that you were investigating groups of people on this zero to four numerical scale of how enhancing versus debilitating they found stress. And you mentioned that the, the group scoring the highest was Navy SEALs. To what degree did the ability of a group to have some sort of agency over the problems facing them factor into how positively they viewed stress? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, we have yet to sample a group that's really seriously traumatized, right? Um, so I don't know, because in all of these samples, you could show that more or less, you know, the UBS people had more or less control over their stress. The Federal Reserve employees, more or less. Columbia undergraduates, more or less. Even the Navy SEALs have more or less control. So we actually, we don't think that the mindset is driven by perceived control. That at any level of control that you have over your stress, you could have a different mindset. So they're orthogonal in that sense. But the caveat is we haven't, you know, we haven't tested truly, you know, I would like to work with a group of, you know, maybe traumatized adolescents or people who have been, um, you know, in countries where they've been in poverty for long periods of time. My hypothesis would be that they would have, you know, different mindsets, um, that it wouldn't depend on the lack of control, if that makes sense. Control in many ways is a psychological construct as well. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, yes, thank you for such a wonderful seminar. I was wondering if you are trying to or have already developed concrete exercises that one could employ to achieve this shift of mindset that you described so that it's become second nature and you're not actively having to do mm -hmm. that. I imagine some people naturally come into yeah. stress with that mindset. And if there are ways people can concretely work on developing through exercises. Yeah. So what do you mean by concrete? <laughs> Actual exercises that, uh, like you might do for physical therapy to train certain things, in this way to train your brain uh, yeah. to ha have such mindset. Yeah, no, I think it's an important question. You know, we've been trying to come up with those, right? So, like, watching these videos could be seen as an exercise or going through these steps, right? But I guess, are you, you know, maybe there are other ways that, you know, you could cognitively train your mind to focus on these things. Um, and, and which of these interventions, I think is what you're getting at, actually leads to lasting effects. So in our studies, you know, the longest we've followed up with people is about uh, six weeks. So, you know, we don't know. And we see other mindset studies have shown effects actually grow over time. Uh, and why do they grow over time? It's because of this self-fulfilling spiral. So is it just, and, and those are studies where they just do one, one training, right, on changing your mindset about intelligence or changing your mindset about the degree to which you belong. 
So the question is, does one dose of this, is that enough, right? Or is there something that you need to fundamentally do to change or totally retrain the wirings in your brain? It's a good question. I think we're working on that now. My sense is that it's actually easier than people think. Yeah. I was just going to ask if we would uh, wish to share your message with others uh, mm -hmm. who aren't here. Uh, does your website have uh, anything that uh, lays out this analysis and recommendations? Yeah. A lot of people that I speak to are like, you know, this was helpful, but my spouse could really use it. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not, sorry, I didn't mean that to suggest you're saying that. But I get that a lot, you know, because it's like, oh, or my child, you know, or like there's so many people that you see around you. Um, thank you for asking that question. I, we have, so I can share um, the, the videos. We have an online training, actually, that walks people through these three steps. It talks about the research and, and all that. So we have articles that you can share, and we have the online training that I'm happy to, to share with all of you. It's not, right now we kind of do it through Qualtrics, you know, platform, so it's not real, you know, um, perfectly done yet. But the videos are nice. It's just the platform. We're working with a company called Spire that, um, it's a wearable that measures respiration rate, and we just did a research study with LinkedIn where they went through this training and we're looking at how their respiration changes. And Spire is actually going to put the training into their app. Um, so things are in the process of that. But in the meantime, I'm, I'm more than happy to share uh, the videos or the papers. If you go to our website, you can um, download any of the research. It's mbl.stanford.edu. And... Um, if there's a link there where you can inquire about the videos, but if you just email me directly, I'll send you a link to the online training. Does that work? Or I can send it to Michael. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.